Good afternoon. I'm so glad you're enjoying your lunch. I hope the sessions this morning have been great for all of you. Um, we're taping this, so I'm going to introduce myself again. Some of you have heard it this morning, but my name is Susie Hansen, and I'm the Executive Director of the Washington Federation of Independent Schools. We welcome you to Private Schools Day, co-hosted with WIFAS on the Puget Sound ESD. WIFAS is the only statewide coalition of all private schools in Washington. We are the appointing agency for positions on OSPI and in the legislative work groups. We serve on the private school advisory committee, and we work directly with legislators, OSPI, and DEL on improving regulations and supporting positive student outcomes, protecting private schools from negative and unintended consequences of proposed legislation. It is my great honor to be here with the two Washington State superintendent candidates. Thank you for joining us today. You both are here to address dedicated, passionate educators who work in and are committed to private school education. Some background information, there are uh, over 80,000 students in private K-12 schools, with many more thousands in the, if we add it in the preschools. There are over 525 private schools across the state. Most are concentrated in the area in which most of your schools are just out area. Today there are 120 or so educators in the room. Uh, looking forward to learning more about both of you. I want to thank Aaron Jones and Chris Reichdell for joining us here today and for running for this very important office. Randy Dorn did excellent work on behalf of students and built a strong relationship with private schools. We are invested in maintaining a close relationship with the next superintendent. The format will, for today will be, we have some uh, questions that we've generated from our schools and from our heads of schools that we will be asking the candidates to answer with one or two minute responses. It's not a debate. However, if they want to address a comment, um, yeah, we're in the debate. Um, but they, they can answer if they have, if, 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 if they think of something that they would like to also comment on that the other person has said, they're welcome to do so. Um, let us begin. I'm not going to go into a long introduction because it's really about hearing from them today. So I'm going to give each one of them a minute or two to introduce themselves and um, tell us a little bit about how to run for this office. And I can flip a coin. Is there something? She certain? always wins, so you pick anyone. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and Erin Jones will be beginning. Thank you. <laughs> so, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Erin Jones. And um, it's great to be here. I have the, the privilege of having been around public and private schools. So I was born in the United States um, in Minnesota. My father, black, mother, white, um, given away to foster care right away and adopted by a white couple who were both teachers. And they adopted another child and then made a decision to teach overseas at the American School of The Hague. So I actually did my K-12 experience um, at a private school in the Netherlands. Um, it's not a DOD school, it's an American private school. Um, I went for free because my parents taught there. So I got the benefit of a $30,000 a year education uh, for free. That's the way to do it. And, um, and really because of that experience, I um, got to meet my first princess when I was nine. Um, I sang with John Denver and Danny Kane when I was nine. It was a good year. 1980 was a really good year for me. Um, but also had the advantage of, of getting to travel. That was part of our experience. We traveled to a different country every year in middle school and um, just had amazing opportunities. And, and to be honest, my only experience of school was that. So when I came to the United States for college in 1989, I was shocked at what kids who looked like me were getting here. And um, it was really an eye-opening experience for me um, to be called the N-word for the first time, to um, have people, I went to an, a women's Ivy League college and to have someone come up to me and say on campus, you're only here because we have to have 10 of you. Wow. Um, I mean, the boldness of that kind of experience was really crushing for me. And um, I had never experienced low expectations, ever, until I was 18 and came to the United States. And, um, it was really my, my second year of college when I was at the, the lowest point in my life that I had the opportunity to meet some young black men on a basketball court and realized how I wanted to spend the rest of my life. These were all young men who looked like me, who played basketball like me, surprised by that I played basketball. Um, 
And I, I knew on that basketball court as I talked to them about drop, every one of them had dropped out of high school. Not one of them believed he was going to ever graduate from high school. And not one believed he was going to live to be 21. I knew on the side of that court how I wanted to look up my life. And, and at 20, I called home and said, I'm not coming back to Europe. I'm going to stay in the United States and become a teacher. And that was 25 years ago. And since got married, have three children, 19, 20, and 21. All of them came up through public school, although we, um, I have two with learning differences that, you know, we were pastors for a long time and thought about putting them in Christian school and said, you know what, I want to commit my life to public school, so I'm going to have my kids go to public school too. And so that was a really conscious choice for us. Um, but I absolutely appreciate the opportunity for young people to have options. And um, so it's such an honor to be here um, representing the many diverse options that are available in the state of Washington. Thanks for having us. Good morning. Thank you for uh, again having us. I'm Chris Raytel, the other candidate for the race. My story is really about uh, Washington State. I was born and raised here to two folks who both had an eighth grade education. My father from Canada, his family, my mother through South Dakota, and somewhere in Everett, Washington, the magic happened. Um, <laughs> so that's pretty exciting. A lot of trauma and a lot of poverty early on. I'm the youngest of eight, even before my sister April and I were born, the oldest six siblings in our family, my oldest six brothers and sisters, spent two years in the foster care system. So the family was put back together, and a pretty substantial revelation, I think, hit my parents, which was a recognition that vulnerable families need supports, not as a lifetime handout, not as a forever thing, but there's a stability that's necessary to give kids an opportunity. And we got that. But it was really my education that changed the game for me. That's the place where I felt like I wasn't the kid on food stamps or the kid living in a home that quite literally we heated with a giant old cast iron uh, oven that, you, that we heated with Presto logs. That was our heat source for our home. So Sunday nights for some kids were like, oh, I gotta go back to school. And for me it was like, please Monday, please Monday, please Monday. Because I wanted to go to school. That's where I just felt like I could break the cycle. And I'm very blessed to have had that chance first in my family to go straight to college. I went to Washington State University, go Cougs. Um, and everybody else, but especially who. <laughs> we don't get far away from the alma mater. You know? That's where I met my wife. She was a swimmer there on scholarship from Southern California, and Kim's a, a 20 year educator as well, a school counselor for the bulk of that, but also a classroom teacher. I began my career as a teacher, I uh, spent four years on a school board. I got a graduate degree in this process from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Kim and I just sight unseen said we're going to we're going to go be Tar Heels. Uh, they offered me a tremendous financial package and Kim's, Kim's school counseling and me public administration because it was really clear when I was in the classroom that I, I began to realize that the systemic change necessary that I was very passionate about in education and schools. I quite frankly couldn't do it in the classroom. I love teaching and I stay in contact with my students. I still get to be in classrooms teaching mostly how a bill becomes a law, uh, how it really becomes a law. <laughs> and so students enjoy that. But um, I've just touched the system in a lot of ways as teacher and school board member and now parent of a fifth grader and a seventh grader. Uh, first superintendent should I be elected in 30 years or more to actually have kids in public school at the time of service. And so the reality of testing and the, re the options of choice and the reality of sort of narrowing curriculum and the, and the sheer worry of parents about public safety in our schools, that is everyday feeling <coughs> for Kim and I. We, we think about that stuff consciously, and you do when your kids are there every day. And, you know, you get the alert messages. The technology now makes the acute worry of building safety just right in your face. The second there's something suspicious in or around your school, you're getting alerted and then heartbeat sort of speeds up. And so that kind of reality is just, um, it's powerful to us. Also in the last 14 years, I've worked with our state's community and technical college system. And many of you interact through uh, dual credit programs in some way or another with that system. And I'm really proud to have grown, running Start College in the high school and all kinds of options for students. And so. Um, I appreciate being here. It's a tremendous uh, opportunity to lead a state. We'll get into the issues, I'm sure, but that's a little bit about my background. Educator, policy leader, finance guy. I bring a lot of different hats to the role, and uh, it is very much a role about $9 billion, 400 employees, and trying to connect every kid, not just public school kids, but every kid to the option that works best for them in a way that's still accountable to the public uh, and when, we, when we share tax dollar resources. So uh, thanks for having us. <coughs> Thank you both so much. Um, so my first question is: Are you when you uh, are you coming into the OSPI hoping to shake things up? 
<laughs> and are there specific things at OSPI that you would swiftly change if you were in office? Yes. <laughs> um, you know, I am someone, I actually started my career, um, well, I started my career in a public school in, in South Bend, Indiana, but then taught two years private school there and then moved here to Tacoma. And um, so I have experience in both and, and made a really conscious choice to join the public school system um, because of the need that I saw in schools. And so my passion is built really been around equity. Um, I spent all of my career in Washington State in Title I schools, our highest poverty schools, our most diverse schools, schools that often communities had forgotten about um, or that felt like they were forgotten by the state even about. And, and so my passion is really around equity. How do we close gaps for students? How do we get honest about talking about race and, and poverty in ways that are authentic? Um, and so for me, shaking it up isn't about firing people or um, that kind of shaking up. But I really believe we need to get honest and have some honest conversation. And I, I also believe that we need to have a really clear vision and a strategic plan, which we haven't had as a state for a long time. Um, you know, I'm a basketball player, and when I can see the hoop, I can score lots of points. If the hoop is moving, it's hard to score a lot of points. And I feel like for us, it's there, we haven't had a really clear vision and a clear strategic plan as a state, and so the first thing that I plan to do is really craft a strategic plan. And here's what I what I know because I, I've taught private school, I've been around the state, I've taught on both sides of our state, and I see in lots of spaces. We all have so much to learn from each other. And I believe that you all should be part of that visioning process of what is high quality education look like. Because I think there, you know, I've spent some time at Seattle Girls School, is that represented here? Anyway, um, but I got to speak at Seattle Girls School and spent the day there um, several months ago. And I was blown away by it because I thought there are so many public school spaces that could learn so much from them. But I bet there are lots of things we can learn from all of you. And so I think we need to allow more voices at the table to really inform that process. And, um, and I also think there are probably things you could learn from us too. And so that actually excites me. This morning I did something completely non-campaign. I actually trained a private school in Tacoma on culturally responsive practice because that's something they don't have opportunities to learn about. And um, they said, can you give us two hours? And I said, sure, I will take two hours out of my day to train you. And uh, so I think there are things that we can learn from each other. And um, this is an incredible opportunity. This is the session of resources, <clears throat> uh, unquestionably. So my first 90 days is a parallel track, uh, obviously immediately putting allies and partners in the room, public and private, and folks from the field and folks in Olympia, because I think it's time for the superintendent to do more than pound the table, but to also have a vision, a plan for fully and equitably and amply funding our schools. Everyone benefits from that. Uh, we've got a great Orla program. Anyone here associated with the Orla program in Olympia? Do you have any Thurston County folks at all? So Orla is a tremendous program where because they've worked hard on funding mostly at the local levy level, they've been able to actually build physical space that has early learning, that meets homeschool families, that does dual credit programs, that does online learning. It's designed to say to the community, our homeschool and private school, let's figure out where we interact. Let's figure out how we support each other. And obviously the benefit to the district is every student who can come there and get some piece of their education, they get to build basic education. So when I talk about fully funding the Cleary and delivering a plan, it's going to rely on a more equitable approach to it. It's going to be bipartisan. It will never be the final plan with four caucuses who think so differently from each other. But I think we owe them a reaction to a court case. And when we actually resource the system more effectively, all kinds of partnership options become available. You all know what happens when schools are underfunded. They grab those dollars and all the things that they want to take a risk on, all the supplemental stuff, all the risk taking in the community to hold tight right into the school to preserve the core. So this is a question for all of us. The second parallel track besides delivering a funding plan and working with the legislature is beginning a Baldrige process, an aggressive evaluation of OSPI. What do we do well? What do we not do well? What are our blind spots? How do you transform the organization to think about results for all kids and not just preservation of pots of money? And every big organization has that, that worry, unfortunately, and it's not sinister. There's amazing people there. But everyone sort of huddles around their pot of money in a world of scarce resources. They say, I don't want to, I don't want to share necessarily. So you got to refocus an organization. I've done that at the community college board office. It's really hard work. It's, it's transformational. It takes a long time. It's not swooping in for two days or five days and sort of rewriting the, the goals on the board. It is actually going through every process and saying, where can we be more effective? What's not working? What kind of risk are we willing to take with each other to do it differently? So 
internal process and a very external budget process for my first nine years. The next question is about early education, which is a hot topic right now in our state and across the nation. So early education is an important topic for, the, for Washington. Do you see early education tied to the definition of basic education? And how do you see um, those two systems that time with one another? This is a question I think we've gotten pretty regularly. I'm trying to think of the geography differences. You get in very different geographies. And it's one of the hardest questions in the world. We don't have the resources right now to fully fund basic ed, which is why there's a court case in place and why there's such an enormous push to get the next three and a half billion dollars. So I actually think from a long-term developmental standpoint of kids in the system that at some point we want to include the three and four-year-olds as a high priority. Whether that's in the legal definition or not, today I would lean towards, yeah, let's get there. The challenge with that is culturally we are not there. Lots of families are not interested in sending their three-year-old and their four-year-old into a big, large public school system. And so today it is delivered through lots of different channels, public and private, religious, non-religious, in-home care, large centers, that system creates the most option flexibility for parents and, and for students. So resourcing it is a different question than should it be basic ed. Because if it becomes basic ed and then our default is every student has to be in this single system, that's going to leave a lot of options off the table. And so for now it is about resourcing it, creating consistent standards that are hopefully a lot more culturally responsive than some of the early stuff that's been rolled out. Um, and then trying to figure out public-private ways to do the professional development so that if we're serious about kindergarten readiness, that everyone who's delivering instruction in social-emotional learning for three and four-year-olds is getting a, a consistent approach to that, a consistent opportunity. That's where I think the public sector can have a lot of opportunity here, partnering with nonprofits and uh, occasionally for-profits, but mostly nonprofits in the community to do the work. That's the great opportunity we have when we go beyond basic ed and fully fund the system, we actually can do some pretty amazing things uh, that empower the community and our partners. So first of all, if you hear me coughing a lot, I was at the South Center Mall last week and someone sprayed bear mace. <laughs> bear mace. Like why anyone has bear mace in a mall, I don't know, but I am now dealing with bear mace. <laughs> so the cough is not sickness. I actually went to the doctor yesterday just to make sure. Um, but yeah, bear mace. Take it out of your purse if you have it now. <laughs> anyway, um, so when it comes to early childhood, I mean, I'm learning all kinds of stuff about this world. And I know for some of you, if we make it part of the early, the basic education definition, you lose your money. So I'm, I'm very aware of that. And so we've got to think carefully about moving that direction, because I think that would be damaging to lots of you that are really benefiting from, um, from being able to have your own private organizations. When I think about early childhood, first of all, I think it's absolutely critical. But as a mom of three kids, you know, I have two biological kids who um, I made a choice to stay home with my children when they were young. Um, I tried to teach and have my oldest one in daycare, and it just he got really sick. And, and I realized as a mom with two black boys, I wanted to make sure they could read and write and do math before they went to public school. I just had watched what happened. But the other thing that I think, as I've watched now as a mom and as an educator, one of the beauties of how you all do early childhood is that you can speak to the cultural norms of your community. And I think those early years are so absolutely critical. Those are the formative years. And, and to be able to really communicate in the language you speak at home. And you know, I speak four languages. I was raised in a, in a school where we had 70 languages represented in, in 70 different cultures. And, um, this idea of making everyone the same, I think, is really dangerous. And, and so I love this option, especially with early childhood. We have much in, in the K-12 system to learn about how do we continue to do that later. Because I think what the danger is, we do a really great job of, of being able to communicate and teach in the culture of our young people, and then they're thrown into a kindergarten class where suddenly they're asked to sit crisscross applesauce and nobody looks like them. And, Nobody sounds like them. And I think that's an honest conversation that we need to be having. And I've been having with schools um, about that transition from early childhood. We have much to learn from early childhood and the K-12 system because I think there's this culture shift that happens. And, and we drop kids from a familiar culture to a really unfamiliar culture. 
And um, that's a conversation we need to have. But I think to really invest in strong early childhood programs is really important. And, and when I say strong early childhood, I grew up in a country where there's not academic learning really until eight years old. And the Netherlands kids play. And so it's learning through play. In many Western European countries, that's how things work. And so I think we're in this place of tension right now where um, when we think about school ready, doesn't mean they know all their numbers in the alphabet and or do they know how to interact with each other or do they know I think we have we have some real learning and, and very courageous conversations I think that need to be happening. And so um, I do believe early childhood is absolutely critical because it sets young people up for success or it sets them up to already show up in the K-12 system with gaps. Um, but what does that look like? It is knowing the alphabet and the numbers the most important thing or is it knowing how to engage with people who are different from me, knowing how to communicate, and knowing how to interact socially. As a mom, my heartbeat is more the social interaction. Um, and, and so I think these are the challenges of the coming years, is we've gotten to the space where so much is about testing and, and knowing academic knowledge, and we're losing that social, how do I engage with someone who's different from me? How do I engage in positive ways? We'd like to know a little bit about how you define and prioritize the role of the state superintendent of public instruction and what maybe differentiates you from your opponent in fulfilling this role. Again, and not in debate format, <laughs> but <laughs> so <laughs> we can hear a little bit of it, but if you could define that for us, that would be helpful. Yeah. We've got this pattern. So and the bear spray's rubbing off of me. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm infecting him. Um, Anyway, <laughs> so I talk about um, I talk about how I want to reframe this job. I had the opportunity to I didn't share this in my intro, but I worked for both Terry Bergson and Mandy Dorn. Um, so director and then assistant superintendent for my last three years, and then the last four years plus I had spent in, as a school district administrator. And so I actually fought the notion of even running for OSPI um, for many years. I had a lot of friends ask me, "Are you going to run? Are you going to run? We want you to run." And I said, oh, I just, bleh. I don't want to think about that. And then I had a friend who actually lives right down the street from here call me one day, and she said, Erin, I think the problem is you've been trying to imagine an OSPI like Randy and an OSPI like Terry, and that's not who you are as a person. And so, Erin, I'm going to challenge you to think about leading OSPI like you lead in the school district, where you spend more time out in the building than you do in the district office where you're walking alongside principals and, and walking alongside teachers and, and listening, what are the barriers, eliminating barriers and providing supports. And, and it was that day I called home to my husband and said, I'm ready to learn. And so I think about reframing the position in three ways, vision, voices, and visibility. We have to, and I've already talked about this, we have to have a clear vision. There has not been a clear strategic plan for here's the breadth of education in the state of Washington. Here's what a high quality education for all children would look like. But we cannot craft that simply at OSPI or simply with lobbyists and legislators and, and agency people. It has to be crafted by new voices because there are voices that have not been ever invited to the table. And we've got to engage those voices. Who are the marginalized students and communities that have not been asked ever what their opinion is? We've got to get those voices to the table to really think about what does success look like for you and your community? and begin to craft that vision that's based on a much wider notion of success. Success is not just graduating from high school. Success is, and really beginning to define that as a, as a community. Secondly, getting new voices at the table in many spaces. So really being close to the ground and listening. What are the needs of community? And lastly, being really visible. Um, I have led from the ground as a leader for the last four and a half years, and um, and my principals appreciated. I have taught classes twice a week as a school district administrator because I believe I can't understand what I have not done. And so, um, and what's awesome about that is my teachers absolutely trust me, and they know that if I'm having, if they're having a hard day with a kid, they can call me and say, "Erin, I'm not really sure." how to do this, could you come and model an activity for me? Could you come teach alongside me? They know I'm willing to get on the ground and get dirty with them. And, and that's what I think really has differentiated me as a, as a leader at the school district office, but also will differentiate me as a state leader, um, because this is not how anyone has led before. And uh, I believe it's time for a change. 
The superintendent is your constitutional office established again in the Constitution to supervise all manner of public education. It's got, again, $9 billion a year, almost $10 billion a year in pass through dollars with some flexibility on the public schools. Uh, there's a staff for 400 folks. I want you to imagine, for my analogy, an hourglass, and you put a stopper in the little funnel in the middle, and, and, and the legislature pours in the sand. The sand is resources and it's policy expectations and student outcome expectations lots of other things in it. What do we expect of teachers, administrators, school board members? You take that stopper off and flip it upside down. OSPI has all that resource that comes to it and all of that policy, and it has to run through that organization. And then when you flip that stopper over, it goes out to the districts, 295 school districts in partnership with private providers and others in the community. They have an expectation of the teaching and learning process that is very locally controlled. Programs are decided by locally elected school boards. It's a very decentralized state for a reason. That's what our voters, our, our founders in the Constitution expected, a state system that would fund and have accountability, but a local system that actually delivered the detail. When you flip that thing back over and the sand goes back through, what's coming to the districts back through OSPI, that narrowing is accountability and data and outcomes. And OSPI's job is to say, this is what's working and not working, so they can go back to policymakers and say, this is where you should invest your next dollar, or this is where it's not working. This is where you've overregulated. This is where districts need flexibility. This is where you've invited private partners effectively, and this is where it's not working with private providers. The legislature contemplates that. We flip it back over. That's the process. You are the filter. It's established that way. So I love the idea of being on the ground, and I've been doing it my whole career as a college administrator. <laughs> We're out in our districts uh, multiple times every month with our business officers, our student uh, association, our college trustees, our college presidents. We're, we're literally overnight in their communities. So I want to be in community, but what I don't want to do is ever have the federal government or Olympia believe that we've come up with a whiz-bang answer that's working and rented. So that's going to be the state policy for everybody. We should share best practices. We should bring information to the field. We should learn from what you're doing and say, does this also add value to the practice in the public side? Our job is information broker and resource broker, but it is not to tell districts what to do. And it's the hardest thing in the world because there are folks who envision K-12 education like they would Microsoft. Come up with a solution. Monetize it. Figure out a way that it works at scale. Get it to everybody so we're all on the same platform. Well, it feels pretty good unless you lose the innovation, unless you lose the ability to do something creative and innovative or bolt onto it or attach to it and tweak it a little bit. As long as we have nearly 1,500 locally elected school boards and 295 districts and 1.1 million students in a state of 7 million, local communities are going to want to touch things. And so it isn't the difference between us. It's a, it's a, it's a how we view the office. And I see it as a CEO role because the Constitution defines it that way, where we really empower districts and empower communities and empower the legislature with good research and data, but not the overbearing organization that would ever suggest that we've got the answers and therefore everyone's going to do it the way we see it. We've enjoyed, as I described before, a very um, close relationship with the Office of uh, Public Instruction, Superintendent of Public Instruction. We have an office there that's designated to private schools. We have a private school advisory council that meets um, throughout the year to talk with different offices. Can you talk a little bit more about how you see private schools integrating themselves into your vision? Yes, so as we transition from No Child Left Behind to Every Student Succeeds Act, that federal law actually calls upon each of the uh, state agencies, if you will, in the 50 states, to create an ombuds that is the relationship and go between in a more enhanced way with the private system. Now, our state took this risk many years ago in some ways, but not necessarily targeted at private schools. It was an ombuds that was placed in the governor's office, largely because, in some cases, special education parents just did not feel like they had a response. Lots of parents, but particularly the special education community. So our state has this interesting reality where we've got an ombuds at the governor's office because folks wanted the governor to get a bigger ear on the concerns of community. And now our federal rewrite of our accountability system puts an ombud specifically to liaison with the private school system at, at OSPI. And I think it's going to be a fascinating thing. I think the legislature is going to have to reconsider whether or not they want their ombuds at the governor's office because it's kind of interesting. What if you're a private school student with a student with disability 
<clears throat> do I get to call two people? Is there somebody who can just broker my case and keep this simple? What is my relationship? So the office of superintendent has to be a lot more intentional about this relationship. It's eight or nine percent of all of our students in your sector. Um, the interactions are more effective than they've ever been. Students utilizing a homeschool or private school option, but then wanting something from a local district because they can provide it at scale. Maybe they have access to advanced math or science or labs or athletics or arts or music. That has to get enhanced. We have to be intentional that in community, as long as we keep the accountability right on the public sector side, the taxpayer side, this office has to say to districts, what makes life easier for you to create those relationships so that parents who are in the system and who liaison with the system go, that's a great local school district. I'm really proud of what they're doing. That's our job. Our job is to take away barriers and make that possible and tell that story to policymakers so they're investing intentionally about those kinds of outcomes. So when I think about the relationship between OSPI and um, private schools, I think definitely at the advisory board, but I think again, like I said about the Seattle Girls School, I've also done some work at Bellarmine Prep um, in Tacoma. We have so much to learn from each other and I think we miss those opportunities to learn from each other. Um, where you also have access to Title II dollars, professional development. And one of the conversations we had in Tacoma where I spent the last two and a half years of my career is are there opportunities where we're doing professional development where we can invite the private school folks to attend? And so I think that becomes now an opportunity as well. How can we think about what are those the needs that you have around professional development and how could we connect you to some local opportunities for you to get learning? I think about again today I did this cultural confidence class for a it was a church school but five different churches invited their people and so we had over 200 people in this space that um, you know and I invited them I said you know you've got a big enough space let's invite lots of people are there other opportunities in the public school system where you could benefit also from learning and I think when it comes to cultural confidence when it comes to special education or gifted programming I think there may be more opportunities that we haven't even looked into right now where because public schools have more resources for that kind of thing, could you tag on in a simple way? I mean, could you just offer to pay um, for the supplies and materials for a course? So I think we need to get creative about um, how we could leverage resources more effectively. I also think there are lots of opportunities at OSPI for people to be at the table thinking about policy, talking about policy and practice. Where to have someone from your community represented at that table could maybe push our thinking. Um, to be really honest, there are lots of spaces of private schools that I've visited where the expectations are much higher. And so how do we push the system sometimes to think about what does that even look like to have expectations that are higher? Um, but I think there are also spaces where maybe expectations are lower in your system and you, we can push you. So I think there are these opportunities for push and pull and sharing resources that we haven't considered yet because the right voices haven't been at the table. And so I guess I would invite you, you know, when I say vision, voices, and visibility, for me, it's all the voices, and, and you are the voices. Um, you're still paying tax dollars, your families are, and so how do we also engage your voices in important conversations? Because I believe we have so much to learn from each other, and because we've kind of segregated how we do school, it's those people over there and these people here, and our greatest learning is when we cross those lines and we build bridges um, instead of walls, and that's really how I have done my work for many years and how I'd like to continue. This is my Phil Donahue moment. I, um, yeah, I don't want to scan for this. I, um, I'm going to um, ask you to think about some questions that you might want to ask, answer that, ask and have them answer. I also want to thank you both again for being here, but also for running campaigns that are kind and compassionate to one another. It's uh, really a joy to, to be in your presence, so thank you. Um, does anybody want to start and ask a question? Be brave. <laughs> Great. You did. That's perfect. <laughs> I am uh, Dwayne Tory, and I'm the International Student Director for Open Events Academy. And uh, I'm new to the position, and my question is. Well, there's been a great influx of international students coming to private schools. In fact, in, I think, 2014, there was a 50% increase. So, um, for example, at our school, we have 
200, approximately 200 students, 50 and 50 international students. My question is for you guys, what ideas do you have or um, experience do you have with international students? How can uh, we as administrators or educators uh, provide resources or uh, help students to reach their proficiency goals in English at our private schools? So I, I was an international student, so I have a little bit of experience with that, um, and spent my my whole growing up experience. But I also was an English language learning teacher. Um, that was one of my certificates, and um, I think one of the things I think the public school system is really challenged by language acquisition. First of all, I just want to own that that we we do a a decent job of training ELL teachers, but we don't do a very good job of training the kind of the average general education teacher. So the, the typical English language arts or math or science teacher is not very well trained even in the public school system. And how do we support students for whom English is not their first language? And so my push has been, um, and I've done this work for the last eight years in teacher education programs, we need to start by doing a better job of training everyone. Because the reality is the nations are coming to us here. We need to acknowledge that. The nations are coming here. Um, I said this yesterday in a, a session, but I think it's important here too. We as a country need to change how we even talk about international people. And, and what I noticed um, being someone who was raised in Europe is there are certain populations of people that are seen as assets to our country and others that are seen as deficits certain accents that are seen as valuable and others that are seen as deficits. And we have to change even that narrative at the top. So at every opportunity, I'm pushing people on that, because that drives how we even see those students and their potential. Because I see often, if someone comes from Spain, we see that as an asset, and we treat them as if they're smart. But if the person comes from Mexico, we see that as a deficit and as they're less smart. And that, to me, is really problematic. We've got to stop that narrative. And so for our international students, I think even reframing the conversation from the top, as you are bringing a culture and a language, and that's a beautiful thing. You're bringing different cultures and different traditions. We should see that as an asset. And how do we give our students, as they're learning English, opportunities to celebrate their culture, to celebrate? What about if, if they came? I, I think about my students from Afghanistan and Spokane who came in and they taught us Farsi in our classroom. And then it became this, this asset that they had, not I'm the kid learning English, but I'm this kid who's teaching Farsi now. And, and so I think we need to kind of reframe the conversation, but I think we also need to do much more professional development for all educators, because the reality is that, especially in private schools, they're not in a ELL class, right? You all are teaching them. And, and so we've got to do a better job of supporting everyone to know how do we effectively support around language acquisition and, and developing academic English. So the first thing we have to do is make sure that, that we have a dialogue in this state and in this country about what a tremendous asset it is to have international students here and for our students to experience international education. If we're serious about globalization, fourth largest uh, international trading state in the country. So part of this is Changing the way we think long-term, training and being intentional about recruiting teachers who are diverse, teachers who speak different languages, bringing this in, not as this perfunctory thing we do in American education where we say, we need you to take two years of world language in high school so you didn't get in University of Washington. That's a dismissive approach that says it's something you have to do to trigger something you really want. Real embrace of language says we're going to put this in middle and elementary schools. I am so blessed to be in a school system. Maybe it helps that my wife's a school board member. My kids are getting Spanish right now in elementary school and middle school. That should not be a function of whether you can raise local property tax levies. That should be an American approach and a Washington State approach to an international system. So there's some things we can do. We can make our students more culturally competent. We can bring language to our schools. We can recruit more intentionally about who's there. And then really see this as a powerful thing so that we can support students. It does take resources. And I'm going to come back to that because it's so important for all of you. When you have a system that is equitably and amply funded, these opportunities become very real. When your system relies so heavily on local property tax levies, wealthy districts can create these kind of accommodations, and districts that don't have local property tax wealth say, we don't have all those extras. So amply, equitably funding changes the game, even in international education.
by the way, the college system that I'm in, the two-year sector, we have a huge and growing international student sector. It's a big part of what we do, and it's a big part of the business. And uh, even they struggle a lot. I'm going to add, marhaba, salam, shalom. Uh, bonjour, buenos dias. It's something that I, I try when I come into spaces to acknowledge because I think um, often it's just being a leader and being able to speak other languages. You know, I taught myself Arabic and Hebrew when I was uh, nine years old. I don't speak either one anymore, so don't come speak to me in Arabic. <laughs> that's what I got, okay? Um, but I had a little girl in my class from Israel and a little boy next door from Palestine. and. Um, and so I intentionally use my role as a leader to acknowledge language and to speak language. Um, I try to get into classrooms and teach Dutch, because how many people speak Dutch? <laughs> and there's nothing like disrupting this narrative of here's a tall black lady with an afro speaking Dutch, right? <laughs> and so really, but really acknowledging that, you know, you laugh, but I think, um, you know, in the United States, we, we don't often speak many languages. and. Um, and really, I, I try when I do public speaking around, especially in schools, to use as many of the languages as I, as I know, and I'll find out which languages do people speak here and try to greet the students in the, their, their home language. And, um, and I know that's a unique skill for me. I mean, I realize that that's not normal. And, but that's one of the ways that I, that I honor our international students, because I think I know what it is to come to this country at 18 and to feel so absolutely alone. And I remember being at a basketball court and having a bunch of black men say to me, you're a freak, you speak so many languages. Seriously, people said that to me, and I said, you're a freak, you only speak one. <laughs> For the record, we don't think anyone are freaks now. <laughs> Just so you know. I was going to ask if you wanted to add anything, but that's a perfect way to end the session. No freak policy. <laughs> Thank you again. That's all we have time for today. Both of their websites offer lots of information about both of, their both of the candidates. And thank you so much, and best of luck in the rest of the